Israel has again stepped up airstrikes across Gaza, saying that it has hit Hamas militant targets. The Hamas-led Gaza Health Ministry today saying that over 5,000 people have now been killed in the bombardment. Hamas has just freed two more hostages, both elderly women, both kibbutz residents. The Red Cross says that it was involved in transporting the women out of Gaza. Now, their husbands were not released. Israel is mourning that the fighting could last for months. Huge explosions in the Gaza Strip. The Israel Defense Forces say they hit hundreds of military targets belonging to the militant group Hamas within 24 hours. The aim is to eliminate their fighters. Another top priority is to rescue hostages. Israel says there are now at least 222 people still being held captive by the terror group. According to a military spokesperson, some ground troops entered the Gaza Strip during the night. One Israeli soldier was killed in the operation. A sortie attacked dozens of points where the terrorists are assembling. The terrorists are getting organized in anticipation of the next stages of the war. And our role is to reduce these threats. So we are exploiting the time available to us to improve our readiness and our ability to carry out the ground offensive in the best possible way. The Israeli army doesn't just have the north of Gaza in its sights, but also the south, because it is also from here that Hamas fires its rockets at Israel. The Israeli military is preparing for the start of a large-scale ground offensive on the Gaza Strip. Here on the border at Kibbutz Beri, Israeli soldiers say they are ready for the next stage of this war. If I'm here to fight, it's to fight for my country, it's to fight for my safety. And I do know that a lot of people look at what we do uh, and see it as barbaric, but personally, to me, I don't know what else there is to do when your country is facing such horror, such atrocities. While Israel appears determined to put boots on the ground in the Gaza Strip, calls for a humanitarian ceasefire are growing around the world. All right, I want to pull in now journalist Karim El Gahari. He joins us from the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Karim, we've got the reports. Two more hostages have been released. What more do we know? Well, there was first uh, a short statement by Al Hamas uh, saying that uh, they are releasing two uh, senior Israeli citizens, Nurit Yitzhak and Yushevet Lifshitz. Um, then there was a confirmation by the Red Cross. Uh, and, and in the Hamas statement, the, one of the curious things in the Hamas statement was that they, Hamas wanted to release them already on Friday, but the statement of Hamas says that the Israeli government refused. Uh, now, uh, shortly ago, there was a, a, a confirmation from the Red Cross mm -hmm. that they took the two refugees and now they seem to be on the Rafah border and coming through Egypt out uh, of the Gaza Strip. Yeah, and we're, we're getting reports too that their husbands who are also hostages, were not released. Do we know um, who brokered this deal? Well, it says it was a combination of uh, the Gulf Emirate, Qatar and Egypt. Uh, I think Qatar, of course, has uh, the central uh, uh, role here in this mediation. We had this already in the release of the last two hostages. You need to know Qatar, of course, hosts uh, the political leadership uh, of Hamas, and uh, this political leadership has, of course, contacts also to the military wing. And so that's uh, the line of talks, I guess, uh, there. Mm -hmm. And then through Egyptian mediations, because they're coming out, it, as it looks like, through Egypt, through the border crossing of Rafah. And, you know, based on your reporting, Kari, what do you think? Could we see more civilian hostages released in the coming days? Well, I had an interview with one of the spokespersons of Hamas in Beirut, uh, Ahmed Abdelhadi, a few days ago. And he distinguished between two kinds of hostages. He said, we have the military, we have the officers and the soldiers. He said, those we will keep until the war is over. And he says, these are the ones that are going to, into, going to be exchanged for Palestinian prisoners. We have more than 5,000 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli prisons. But he says the civilians, we can talk now about it. And uh, he also at that time said that 
some of them lie on the table of the mediators, and he probably meant uh, in that case mm -hmm. Qatar, and this is probably what we're seeing here right now. Journalist Karim al tonight with the latest from Cairo and the latest details about these two additional hostages being released by Hamas. Kareem, thank you. You're welcome. Our senior international correspondent, Fanny Fachar, she told us how the next phase of this war, this conflict, could possibly unfold. It's really interesting because since I've been covering this for the past two weeks, there were really various momentum building up at, uh, just shortly after the uh, terrorist attack by Hamas militants on October 7th. It seemed as if a major ground offensive is imminent, but then there was really a delay, as at least it appeared to be a, a delay, when a lot of uh, diplomats came to visit Israel, be it U.S. diplomats or uh, the chancellor from Germany, for example, talking with Prime Minister Netanyahu. And it seemed as there is going to be a delay and just very unclear when a ground offensive will take place. Will a ground offensive even take place or will it be something else? And now we're hearing now again with this renewed warning by Israel that people should evacuate from northern Gaza and go towards the south and that they are likely going to intensify their airstrikes. That again, it appears that there's this momentum building up that the troops that are amassed there along the border with Gaza Strip, the Israeli tanks and everything, that they're all ready to go in. It is unclear when this is going to happen. We're hearing, though, if it will start, it will probably a will probably be a battle that may take months. And the, the question here is obviously why that violence is flaring up, not only in Gaza Strip, but also in other parts here in the region, how all of that is just going to be interlinked and what it's going to mean for ordinary citizens that are caught up in this violence. And that was ZW's Funny Fichar reporting from Jerusalem. Earlier, I spoke with Joost Hilterman. He's the director of the Middle East and North Africa program at the International Crisis Group. And I asked him, how long does he think this war will last? It is impossible to tell. Um, frankly, it could go on for a very long time when it spreads, if it spreads. Um, but it doesn't have to go that way. Uh, we could also look at a possible ceasefire at some point, not so long from now, um, if uh, Western friends of Israel persuaded that a military offensive in Gaza is going to be very costly for Israeli soldiers, especially for the civilian population in Gaza, and it may not end up with the defeat of Hamas. So um, the wiser course forward would be a diplomatic one. And I think that the hostage negotiations could mm. could uh, form a solid basis for that. Well, um, Hamas says that it has released two more hostages. I mean, what do we know about the role of regional powers as mediators here? Well, we're talking mostly about uh, uh, Qatar, of course, in the case of the hostages. Um, but in the past, uh, other countries have also presented themselves as mediators between Hamas and Israel, with Egypt, because Egypt is the border country, uh, and, and Turkey as well, which uh, has hosted Hamas people. Uh, and Qatar has been the main one, also hosting uh, Hamas um, and, and also having a relationship with Israel, uh, which in the past has meant that uh, Qatar has been able to support uh, or provided uh, humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, with that kind of basis, it's much easier to start negotiations about such a difficult question as the release of hostages. There were reports today of the Israeli military striking targets in Lebanon, Hezbollah targets. What do you see as a possible red line for Hezbollah? What might prompt Hezbollah or Iran, for that matter, to open up another front in this war? Now, the exchanges between Hezbollah and Israel have been going on ever since the, the war in 2006 on that border. So they're used to it each side, and they have uh, each have their, their red lines. Now, these red lines are not published, so uh, they, they leave each other to guess. Um, now, in the in the past two weeks, those uh, exchanges of fire have escalated, but now it seems that they, they both have sort of settled on a, an area of about two kilometers from the border on each side. So whatever happens in those, uh, in those two zones is okay. Um, if something goes on beyond that, then 
we may enter a different game. So I would look for that kind of escalation and uh, not be too worried about the exchanges of fire within this limited area for the moment. Your organization, Crisis Group, has called for um, a ceasefire. How would that work considering Israel says that its ultimate goal here is to destroy Hamas? Can a ceasefire and the destruction of Hamas, can those two things exist, coexist? Probably not. Um, and um, But Israel has said it wants to achieve this. But I think uh, the Israeli leadership is deeply divided uh, for a number of reasons. One is because it's not clear that uh, they believe that Hamas can be defeated militarily. Um, secondly, because uh, if they proceed with uh, a military campaign, say a ground offensive, aimed at defeating uh, Hamas and destroying it, uh, they may destroy all of Gaza in the process, and that would uh, probably <laughs> lead, I would hope so, mm. to, to a pushback from, from uh, Western France. And finally, going for, uh, for Hamas may also mean uh, losing the lives of all the, the hostages that Hamas holds. And I'm not sure that there is a unity in Israel about that particular strategy. Yul Stilterman from the International Crisis Group. Mr. Hilderman, we appreciate your time and your analysis tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another convoy carrying desperately needed supplies has crossed from Egypt into Gaza, the third in as many days. But the United Nations says at least 100 truckloads are needed every day in order to avert a humanitarian catastrophe. Convoys carrying international aid are finally rolling over the Egyptian border into Gaza. Here at this warehouse in the central Gaza Strip, the boxes are sorted out before being distributed to the areas where they're needed most. Boxes of food and water from Japan are arriving at this school in Khan Yunus that is now a shelter. But amongst the relief here, there is also frustration. I left home without taking anything except the shirt and pants I had on. The aid they've brought us is just a small amount of what's needed. We don't want aid. We want to return to our homes. Stop killing our children and slaughtering us. We don't sleep during the day or night due to the shelling and the misery we're living in. Enough. We do not have any more patience. We're drained. We don't feel human anymore. It seems unlikely that these Gazans will be able to leave this shelter and return home soon. Well, some humanitarian aid is now getting into the Gaza Strip. We asked journalist Hajim Belusha if it's making much of a difference. We are talking about 54 trucks came in three days um, in total in comparison with a, with a regular time before the war. 500 trucks used to come daily with different items. Um, uh, mainly these trucks, they are talking about three main things, food, um, medical supplies and water. While Gaza need more other things, um, uh, and these uh, uh, aid come through UNRWA and uh, the Red Crescent. Um, still, like these, these, these aids go to some of the hospitals and and, and to um, UNRWA refugee, um, uh, UNRWA schools, like where refugees taking it as a shelter. Uh, but um, the ordinary people in their houses, they are not receiving these aids. Plus, the most important is the, the, the fuel, which is not coming here. It's the fuel is affecting the, the function of the hospital, the transportation, the pumping of the water uh, to the houses, um, uh, the desalination uh, stations, the treatment of waste water. All of these things like need fuel, and still these things are not coming in. So we, we haven't seen actually um, a huge difference on, in, on this regard. That was Hajim Belusha there reporting. Gaza's hospitals have been overwhelmed by the number of casualties being brought in because of Israeli airstrikes. Clinics are short of staff, medicines, and beds. And among the most vulnerable patients are newborn babies. A tiny child struggling to breathe. Without life support, it wouldn't stand a chance. 
At Gaza's largest hospital, the head of the intensive care unit for premature births worries that time is running out for his patients. We call on everyone to send the necessary medical supplies for this critical department, or else we will face a huge catastrophe. Especially if the electricity is out in this department, where there are 55 babies. We'll lose all those who need electricity within five minutes. Since Hamas's deadly attacks on October 7, Israel has enforced a near total blockade of the Gaza Strip. Electricity has been cut, and medicine and fuel for generators are fast running out. All the while, the Israeli Air Force pounds Gaza relentlessly. The bombings have flooded Gaza's hospitals with casualties. Some are women who are pregnant or have just given birth. We have a baby who was delivered at 26 weeks and he weighed 880 grams. The mother was referred from the north in an ambulance after the house next to her was hit by an airstrike. The mother was referred to the delivery room and she was panicking with dust and fear on her face. We realized that she was in a delivery phase. She delivered this baby and he was admitted to the intensive care unit. The Shifa hospital is in Gaza's north, where Israel is expected to launch a ground invasion soon. Added peril for the hospital's patients. The Al-Aqsa hospital further south is also struggling to cope. Mothers are despairing over their newborns. There's a shortage of capabilities in hospitals, and we're afraid that things will get worse and that we won't find treatment for our children. The World Health Organization says that at least 50,000 pregnant women in Gaza are not receiving necessary health care. Over 5,000 are due to give birth soon, in a life-threatening environment.